our first speaker of the day. It's Magnus Fontes from uh, Institute Rock and Glucor. It's a great pleasure to have Magnus here. He is a PI in our network, as I mentioned before. He is an extremely successful colleague on all various levels, both as an academic. Uh, he held professorships in, in Lund, at Lund University and in Copenhagen, both as a founder. Uh, he founded Glucor, one company that is part of our network, and he held influential and important roles in industry, in Genentech and the Institute Rush that I already mentioned, where he is since last year, even the general manager of this uh, important unit in, in Roche. Um, Magnus is an expert in, in bioinformatics, machine learning and mathematics, in particular in the analysis and the visualization of high dimensional data. That's also one focus of Glucor, the company that is part of our ITN. I'm really happy to, to have Magnus here and uh, to learn more uh, from him about his work and, and research now and then in the next one and a half hours. Um, Magnus, um, the floor is yours and we are excited to listen to your talk. Thank, thank you so much for these very, very kind words, uh, Kerstin. Uh, I'm super happy to have this opportunity. So I thank you and, and all of the organizers as well as the attendants for, for this opportunity to present. So uh, my talk is, is called Statistical Learning and Visualization, Defining and Looking at the Cancer Immunity State Space. But uh, actually, I will, I will take it in the other <laughs> way around. I will, I will start by, by trying to describe what we are trying to solve uh, within cancer immunity. And uh, I think it is um, an area where, where the, the skills and expertise that uh, you in the network here uh, have, and uh, in particular, the young researchers that is attending, um, uh, have a great opportunity to contribute and make, and make a real difference. So, so I will try to describe um, <clears throat> the kind of make a problem formulation and invite um, all of you to, to, to help out and work with us to, to see what we can do in, in, this, in this area. These are my disclosures and affiliations. Uh, Karsten mentioned them. Uh, and I would like to, to actually start with uh, the coronavirus. Uh, so, so you can hardly open uh, a journal today or a newspaper or, or look at television without hearing about mathematics and immunology. And that is, that is quite a change, uh, I would say, from, from, from before the pandemic. The pandemic has, of course, changed a lot of things for us. Uh, I guess this is the reason why we are not together in, in, in Basel at the moment, uh, some of us at least. Um, uh, but I, I, I also think it, it, it points out um, the importance of uh, inference from data. So we are flooded by, by data. Uh, as I said, you open any uh, newspaper like the New York Times here or, or some other uh, paper and uh, you get data, <laughs> you get um, learnings from that data. And I think it points to, 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 to the importance of, of, of uh, actually uh, trying to understand the data you're looking at. Is it biased? Uh, uh, are there outlayers uh, in, this, in this data? And what kind of robust inference can we actually draw uh, from the data? Uh, I just want to highlight uh, one fellow Swede, uh, Hans Rusling, uh, that unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, but he was the founder of Gapminder. And I think at least in my, in my view, um, the, the main message uh, that he, he wanted to, to pass on, this is at least my interpretation, is exactly that you should, you should um, be aware of uh, bias in the data of outlayers, and you should try to draw robust inference and insights from the data and, and, and really learn from uh, the data you're, you're looking at. Uh, <clears throat> so let me start with, with an example here. 
So this is uh, a study that appeared um, uh, very recently in Science Advances. I was I was uh, uh, fortunate and lucky uh, to to be uh, involved in this together with some of my former colleagues from uh, Institut Pasteur uh, in in Paris. And um, I want to highlight this uh, just to show you that it's not only drawing robust inferences from data, but also using the data sometimes in a little bit um, uh, surprising directions, maybe, or 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 <clears throat> or so. I mean, so this study was was made on uh, a couple of cohorts, so a cohort of of melanoma patients in 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 France um, that underwent a different kind of therapies for their melanoma. We also had a healthy uh, control cohort. And the goal of this study was, was to see if uh, so-called uh, checkpoint inhibition uh, was um, beneficial uh, during uh, COVID-19 in infection, because uh, a, a part of these melanoma patients, uh, they received so-called checkpoint inhibition, and I will come back to exactly what that is, or they received different types of immunotherapy. And of course, some of these uh, melanoma patients also uh, got COVID-19. And uh, in this way, we could then try to infer uh, the effect of uh, checkpoint inhibition on COVID-19 infection. So um, the, the list you have to the left here shows you the different therapies that these patients received. And you see immunotherapy, you see anti-PD-1 only, or anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4, etc. So it, this also highlights that um, the therapy that you receive uh, when you have melanoma, for instance, but also many other cancer indications have changed drastically over the last 10 years. So in, in 2010, uh, when Siddhartha's book that I guess some of you have read, The Emperor of All Maladies, it was published, checkpoint inhibition therapies did not exist yet. Uh, they were not available, and actually uh, Siddhartha he, he doesn't even explicitly address immunotherapy in his book. But already in 2011, the first checkpoint inhibition uh, therapy was uh, approved, and then just a year after, uh, another checkpoint inhibition therapy was approved, and for, for the work behind those approvals, uh, uh, Allison and, and Honjo uh, received jointly the Nobel Prize in 2018. And I can recommend, uh, at least I thought, the, the breakthrough, the immunotherapy and the race to cure cancer is a, is a nice description of uh, what has happened over the last 10 years. It's a popular book uh, that I, I think uh, you, you might enjoy. So what is uh, checkpoint inhibition? Well, uh, what it, when, it, when, it, when a T cell uh, uh, tries to uh, recognize uh, non-self and, and do something about it in, 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 in our bodies, uh, there are multiple signals that has to happen for a T cell to, 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 to kill a tumor cell or to kill a cell that is infected by a virus or some other pathogen. And uh, actually, the immune system, as I guess many of you know, is a quite complex uh, system to study with many uh, feedback uh, loops. Um, here you can see the antigen presenting cells part of the immune system. They can be dendritic cells or other antigen presenting cells. On their surface, they carry a peptide uh, MHC complex that basically describe the antigen that they have picked up and found. And that antigen is recognized by a specific uh, T cell receptor, a TCR. And that is one signal that has to happen. Then there are also co-stimulatory uh, signals that have to happen for a T cell uh, to take action. 
But uh, on top of this, uh, the T cell uh, is also covered with uh, other uh, protein, uh, transmembrane protein receptors like CTLA-4 and PD-1. And those are so-called immune checkpoints. And this was the discovery of, of those and how they uh, could put a break on an immune response what was what led to the, to the Nobel Prize I, I just mentioned. So if um, a PD-1 or a CTLA-4 receptor on the surface of a, of a T cell interacts with its ligand, uh, so the PD-1 ligand is PDL1, there are also another ligand called PDL2, etc. But uh, if that happens, if it binds, uh, that leads to uh, that proliferation uh, and effector functions uh, and survival is inhibited. So the T cell does not do its job of, of, of killing off the cell. The, the cell presents uh, PDL1 and shows that uh, do not kill me, uh, I'm, I'm a normal cell. And this is a way that, that um, tumor cells also can avoid uh, attacking uh, by the <clears throat> immune system and, and the killing. Uh, now, of course, this checkpoint inhibition is just one type of uh, immune therapy. There are many immune therapies, and you can go to the Cancer Research Institute website and have uh, a lot of descriptions of the different types of therapies that uh, are being um, explored. The, these therapies are then explored in order to attack uh, or, or, or cure uh, cancer of different types. And cancer is, of course, a group of diseases that is highly diverse, uh, very complex. What they all uh, have in common is that there are some mutations in, in somatic cells, uh, cancer cells, that leads to uh, proliferation, abnormal pro proliferation. Uh, so the, the, the cells uh, start to divide and, and grow and form uh, a tumor. Uh, whether that is in, in blood, like in, in uh, different types of leukemia, or uh, for a solid uh, tumor uh, somewhere in, in, in the body. You see here uh, uh, a diagram. Uh, so on the y-axis, you have basically the number of mutations. And then on the x-axis, you see different types of cancers. And as you can see here, there are some cancers where the cancer cells have a lot of mutations or highly mutated, many different types of mutations. And those cancers are colorectal cancer, lung, and melanoma. And of course, these um, cancers, what they have in common is that they occur in organs that uh, face the external world. So uh, color, the colorectal cancers, of course, face everything that, that we are eating or, or drinking, or, or the colorectal system face what we are eating and, and, and drinking. Lung, uh, of course, everything that we, that we breathe, uh, uh, whether that is smoke or, or, uh, or, or, or fresh air, it makes a, a huge difference. And melanoma, of course, occurs in skin that is in contact with direct contact with the surroundings uh, like sunlight uh, and others and all as we know all a lot of different things are highly mutagenic and and this leads to these uh, high tumor uh, mutational burden in in colorectal lung and melanoma and this is also some of the cancers that have where we have been most successful with immunotherapies uh, I would like to describe uh, to you a little bit uh, something called the cancer immunity cycle. Uh, this was uh, published and in, or invented by Dan Chen and Ira Melman from Genentech. And they published on it, uh, uh, I think it was in 2013, yes. Uh, so, so what is what happens when a tumor uh, uh, starts to grow? Well, normally, when you have mutated cells uh, that start to divide, the immune system in our body should recognize this and, and uh, take care of it and kill off those tumor cells. And how does that happen? Well, 
there is release of so-called cancer cell antigens. So these are small peptides that correspond to the mutated part uh, of, a, of a gene in the, in the tumor cells. So they, they should be recognized as, as non-cells. These peptide parts are picked up by antigen presenting cells like uh, dendritic cells. This is step two here. And uh, uh, these dendritic or antigen presenting cells uh, then travel to uh, the lymphatic system, to a lymph node, where they prime and activate uh, T cells. So T cells uh, recognize their cognate antigen and, and, and have a monoclonal expansion. And uh, then those uh, expanded T cells, they uh, travel through blood to uh, tumors. Uh, and hopefully they then infiltrate into the tumors. Uh, they recognize the cancer cells uh, by their T cell receptors and they kill the cancer cells. So this is what, what should happen and what we want to promote uh, if, it, it, if it doesn't happen. And here you have uh, a lot of known stimulatory factors spelled out as well as, as uh, some uh, inhibitory factors that, that we know about. So this is in green and in red correspondingly. Uh, Dan and Ira then published another paper a few years later where they uh, highlighted something they called uh, the cancer immune set point. So why the cancer immunity cycle doesn't uh, become a, a good cycle uh, with a, a result uh, of killing of, of tumor cells by T cells. It, it might be that the simply the, the stimulatory factors uh, minus the inhibitory factors. So if you look at this formula, this is actually a formula from uh, their article elements of cancer immunity and the cancer immune set point. So, so it says basically that the sum of stimulatory, immune stimulatory factors minus the sum of inhibitory factors is, it has to be greater than the threshold for this cancer immunity cycle to, to spin around and for the tumor to be uh, killed off by, by, by T cells. That is of course very vague. Uh, and I, I would say that part of the work that we are, are trying to do now, and I say we as a, as a global community of, of modelers and uh, uh, cancer immunologists, what we are trying to understand and make sense of something like the cancer immune set point. Uh, and I would say that uh, at least how I think about this, uh, being a, a mathematician, is that there is a state space. Uh, the cancer immunity state space is a very, a very conceptual thing, but as soon as we start to measure things, uh, we can use those measurements to try to have some approximation, a realization of, of, of this imaginary uh, cancer immunity state space. And uh, we measure a lot of things, and I will come back to exactly what we measure, but genetic, epigenetic, environmental factors across many different scales um, in, 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 in cancer. Uh, so the, the concept here is that, of course, that all the things that we measure, there are normally relations between those things, whether they are 25,000 different genes that we have measured, uh, and, and that makes up uh, 25,000 dimensional space. And of course, any point in this space cannot be attained by a, a living organism or, or, or a human. Uh, there are uh, simply certain parts of this measure space that, that are viable, where you can actually sustain life. And uh, as, as, as you all know, uh, as soon as we have functional relations between the underlying variables, this, uh, this actually confines uh, the samples to a lower dimensional uh, space, whether that is uh, uh, can be thought of as a, as a manifold or some uh, more complex uh, subset of, of the, the space we, we are measuring. Uh, then 
obviously, I mean, a lot of the measurements we, we do on, on patients or on model organisms, etc., uh, we try to assess uh, fitness or health status of, of the individuals. And uh, those uh, fitness measurements uh, can be used to assess where in the 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 uh, state space uh, you are you are sitting at the moment and if you if you study cancer and cancer immunity and and you have measurements on patients uh, there will be uh, domains of this space that more are more uh, prone to to correspond to a healthy state and and some parts of the of the of the space that that are, are prone to to have harbor more non-healthy uh, states and the goal of of uh, treatment is is always to try to push the patient from a non-healthy position into a more uh, healthy position and and here of course everything that i've been talking about uh, so far is actually dynamical uh, processes and and most of the measurements we have at the moment are static and I will come back to to that as well uh, this is just to give you an idea of uh, this is uh, from the Cancer Research Institute uh, website and it's to give you an idea of the of the immune oncology development space here you see some of the uh, uh, therapies that are being pursued and, and you see that there are thousands of different types of immuno uh, uh, therapies in treating cancer and it has grown enormously over over the years and it's still we are still in a very quick expansion phase you see here different clinical trials phase one phase two phase three approved etc and you see also there is a lot in preclinical. So these are uh, the molecules and targets that are pursued in, in, in uh, animal models, et cetera. So currently, at least, there are over 3,000 immunotherapy uh, combination trials ongoing with involving more than half a million patients. And every such trial, you can actually, from a being a mathematician, I look at this as uh, actually perturbation experiments on the immune system, trying to understand from perturbing the immune system how the immune system actually works and how it interacts with, uh, with uh, uh, a cancer, a tumor. Uh, <clears throat> This is uh, uh, Vivli, which is a clinical research data sharing platform uh, that has a lot of clinical trials. And here you can uh, request uh, to access uh, uh, clinical trial data and you can search clinical trials and uh, make suggestions of what type of research you would like or what type of research questions you would like to address. Uh, uh, by uh, accessing uh, this data. So this is an, uh, uh, at least a, 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 an effort to, to make available some of all this clinical trial data for, for research. Another rich, um, I would say, a source of, of, of data is, of course, the, the cancer gene genome atlas tcga that you all know about you can access all these data sets through the genomic data commons data portal also has a lot of of valuable data and also valuable insights you can explore uh, the tcga data through for instance the iatlas explorer there is also a lot of uh, different options directly from the uh, from the portal uh, <clears throat> if you want to learn uh, about what has been concluded so far from the TCGA data, I would maybe start with looking at uh, the, the, um, uh, the Pan Cancer Atlas website from Cell, Cell Press, uh, where they have selected a lot of articles that give um, an overview of what has been learned so far through the TCGA project. 
obviously there there is a lot more uh, information outside of this but this could be a good entry point if you if you if you are starting so let me now uh, go a little bit and, and, and give an example. So um, I uh, have looked a little bit at a data set that is available uh, at the website down to the right here. So you can access this data as well as R-based analytics and you can interact with the data. And uh, this is the data that I, uh, I have been looking at a little bit just to give an example of, of uh, what you can learn and and how you can start to to have an idea of this cancer immunity state space so this data is uh, a phase two uh, trial um, uh, we uh, uh, the specific data i'm looking here at here is bulk mrna uh, expression uh, from the tumor microenvironment at baseline um, and uh, the treatment here is uh, blocking PDL1 with atezolizumab uh, in uh, metastatic uh, bladder cancer. So let us have a first look at this data. So um, here we have 300 patients. Uh, we have 28,204 variables or genes. Um, so this makes up a huge matrix, uh, sample matrix, uh, samples times variables. And what I did here was simply uh, a principal component analysis uh, plot. So uh, just projecting uh, samples uh, down to 3D from 28,204 dimensions down to three dimensions, keeping as much of the variance in the samples uh, as, as possible in this projection. So that, that is PCA. And then I have colored them according to an annotation that is response. Response in solid tumors is normally measured by something we call RESIST 1.1, which is a protocol for, for uh, 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 deciding uh, response. So we have complete response, partial response, stable disease, and progressive disease. And uh, this is measured uh, simply by imaging. So uh, X-ray or other uh, uh, imaging techniques. And we basically just look at, are, is the tumor growing? Uh, is it shrinking? Uh, is it disappearing? Uh, complete response here is green. Uh, progressive disease is, is, is red, and then there is a scale in between. And maybe you can agree with me when you look at this spinning uh, PCA here, 3D, that captures 19% of the variance in the, in the data, which is fairly okay. But maybe there are some domains that uh, are more favorable, where you have more green uh, patients. Uh, so, so patients that actually respond to this checkpoint inhibition. And maybe there are some domains that contain more red patients. Uh, but then you would like to filter away some of the uh, variables that, that contain very little variance here and see if we can get a clearer picture. So how do you uh, do this? How do you filter away in an objective way, filter away uh, some of the noise so this is a publication 10 years ago that I wrote with Charlotte Sonneson, which is uh, uh, at the Swiss Bioinformatics Institute uh, currently. And uh, what we did was that we looked at uh, basically the, so, so, so you have alpha two here and uh, uh, lambda k are the singular values and uh, R is the rank of, of the sample matrix. So if you look at the denominator here in the alpha two expression here, that corresponds to the total variance in the data set. And then the numerator is uh, basically how much of the variance you capture in, in, in a certain uh, uh, subspace of, um, of uh, corresponding to singular values. So we look at, at this, the signal we capture and the total signal, and then we compared what we had in our uh, data 
with the expected value would you would have from random data and then we plotted started plotting this and the amazing thing was that we got plots like what you see in the middle of of the picture here namely you you have a clear optimum meaning that when you start filtering away uh, uh noise uh you the the the, the difference between what you actually capture in your uh, data set in terms of, 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 of uh, noise to signal uh, as compared to what you would have in random data has a clear optimum. Um, uh, and actually, when I looked at this projection score, which is the name we, we gave this, uh, so I optimized over our Invigor 210 data, and uh, there was a clear maximum for seven uh, dimensions. Uh, and uh, you also see this on this uh, scree plot that it, it makes sense also from just inspecting the, the scree plot. So then I did a projection score uh, optimization in seven dimensions, and then I uh, created a, a graph uh connecting the two nearest neighbors in this case and then i did uh, multi-dimensional scaling on the resulting distance matrix so this corresponds to the isomap uh, algorithm uh, <clears throat> and this is what you see here uh, now maybe you can agree with me that there are some domains that contain mainly red points here so so progressive or stable disease and some domains that contain more a mixture of, of, of green and red. And there might even be some domains here that mainly contain green points, so re responders. Down to the right, I uh, have colored according to something called the Lund or TCGA taxonomy. So this taxonomy is based on immunohistochemistry plus mRNA expression and gives different uh, uh, subpopulations of metastatic uh, bladder uh, cancer. And as you can see, uh, the, the operations we did with the projection score optimization followed by isomap embedding pretty much captures uh, those uh, subgroups that, that are uh, based then on uh, immunohistochemistry and mRNA uh, expression. So this is the uh, reference for uh, TCJ or Lund taxonomy. Uh, what I what I then did with this uh, with this data uh, was that I performed a rank regression with respect to response, uh, and and of course uh, I uh, adjusted for the false discovery rate. So the adjusted p-value cutoff I put to zero point zero five. And that cutoff uh, resulted in 50 genes. And then I, I here did a PCA biplot where I can see the distinct variable clusters that are driving the signal. So in the plot here to the left, you have the samples. To the right, you have those 50 variables. And this is a synchronized biplot. So uh, the uh, samples uh, that find themselves in the same direction as, as, as variables here, uh, that means that those variables are highly expressed in those samples. And as you can see here, I also colored the variables to the right according to the mean expression in the complete response group. And, and as you can see, there are a few clusters of, of variables. And when I did a database search, so I basically did a, a gene set enrichment analysis. Uh, I used gProfiler that you can find down to the, to the left. Um, this is a, a, a website where you can go and you run several different uh, uh, enrichment uh, programs. And what, what they all found was that <clears throat> this corresponded to, to cell cycle uh, upregulation, as well as uh, interferon uh, gamma signaling, so interferon 2 uh, signaling and from gamma, and CXCR3 chemokine receptor binding. This is what, what, what was particular about uh, the, response, the response group. So the conclusion here is maybe that uh, checkpoint 
the inhibition in Invigor 210 is highly, so the response to this treatment is highly correlated with CXCL9 expression. So to the left, you see the discriminatory genes, the top 15 ordered uh, by uh, Q value or adjusted uh, P value. So the, 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 the strongest correlation with response is in CXCL9, uh, and CXCL9 is uh, 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 chemokine that is uh, actually induced by interferon gamma, and uh, it recruits T cells uh, and NK cells, etc. So, so it's an it's a it's a T cell uh, recruitment uh, uh, molecule. This is also true for CXCL10, uh, closely related to CXCL9, and they bind to this uh, CXCR3 uh, that we saw on, on, on the former uh, slide. You also see CXCL13 here, which is uh, actually uh, a, a B cell, uh, more a B cell recruitment uh, uh, chemokine. So this is a study also fairly recently uh, from February uh, uh, 2021 by Charles Swanton and others, where they did a meta-analysis across uh, many different uh, checkpoint inhibition treated cases. And they found uh, biomarkers that were uh, tumor mutational burden, as well as CXCL9 and CXCL13 expression. These are the strongest predictors overall for checkpoint inhibition response. So that corresponds to T and B cell uh, 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 chemokines. Uh, when, I, when I started digging into the data a little bit more and looked at signals that were more orthogonal in the, in the cancer immunity state space here, uh, I found that the, uh, one of the strongest signatures was, was an Applebeck signature. So here to the left, uh, you see uh, again the, uh, the data colored according to response. And to the upper right, uh, you see the expression uh, colored according to CXCL9 expression. And down uh, to the bottom right, I, I colored according to Applebeck 3B, uh, so one of the Applebeck uh, protein signals. And as you see, uh, both CXCL9 and Apobec uh, drive uh, the response signal in slightly or almost orthogonal here when you pro project down to 2D, an optimal projection down to, to 2D. So what is this Apobec? Well, it's, <clears throat> uh, it's actually a family of, of, of proteins that uh, people have noted over the last years and, 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 and highlighted as a potentially predictive marker for uh, uh, immunotherapy response. I can um, recommend this uh, review of Apobec, uh, a recent, uh, recently published uh, a little bit over a month ago, where they point out the roles of different uh, Apobecs. So, so Actually, as, as it said here, they orchestrate a wide array of genomic and epigenomic modifications, so affecting cellular functions, and it has to do with uh, immune editing, DNA dam damage response, methylation, gene expression, and homeostasis, tissue home homeostasis. So it is an interesting potential uh, target. And if I look at the overall survival uh, in the Invigor 210 data, so this is a Kaplan-Meier plot, you see in, in red here are the CXCL9 high. I have a median cutoff. Uh, and the, uh, the green uh, is, is CXCL low, so below the median. And as you can see, you basically you do better if you uh, are CXCL high at baseline, remember. So these are bulk expression values uh, from the tumor microenvironment at baseline. Then I look at here at Kaplan-Meier plots for Applebeck uh, 3D uh, to the left using a median split. And you see basically the same thing as you saw for CXCL9, the T cell uh, attractor chemokine, 
that you do better if you are apple neck uh, 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 high. Um, so this is the red, apple back high, and apple back low is the green, the median split again. Then I actually took only the CXCL9 high group, so this is to the right, uh, and, and, and uh, only for these patients I, I looked at uh, apple back high versus apple back low. And here you see that actually you do even better if you both CXCL9 high and apple back high. Um, so when I looked also at the at, uh, uh, correlation between CXL9 and apobec 3 b they are fairly uh, weakly correlated as, a, a, as expected. So they really uh, pick up two different parts of the response uh, signal. This was just an example uh, of data that you can access immediately uh, and, and start to interact with and try to uh, draw new conclusions like I, I, I did here. Of course, this was uh, bulk uh, mRNA expression from the tumor microenvironment. And uh, now we are trying to do uh, much more. And this is actually where I think there are a lot of opportunities for you as uh, a machine learning community, AI community, uh, mathematical modeling community to make a difference and work with uh, cancer uh, or uh, immunity uh, researchers and try to better understand uh, the, the cancer immunity state space. I think you can do a lot by integrating things like systems biology approaches, maybe uh, modeling the dynamical networks that, that, that take place between different chemokines, uh, different cells, the crosstalk between different cells in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, we are now getting a lot of single cell uh, data from tumors, and we are even starting to generate longitudinal single cell uh, uh, data. This will possibly make it uh, possible to, to, to make more holistic models where we actually look at the cell uh, cellular crosstalk in the tumor microenvironment and as well as the dynamics of what is happening in the tumor microenvironment. Obviously, we would like to predict what is happening in the tumor microenvironment from uh, less invasive uh, sampling through through peripheral blood, so really looking at, uh, for instance, T cell receptor repertoire and B cell receptor repertoire in blood over time, and from that try to infer what is happening in the tumor microenvironment, as well as uh, so picking up things like uh, 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 CT uh, DNA, so so tumor DNA that is circulating in the blood, um, and and. Obviously, we would we would love to have uh, more data connecting uh, blood, the tumor microenvironment, and the lymph uh, system. Uh, so now I will come to uh, a presentation of of um, a method that uh, we are we are developing. Um, so uh, this method is uh, what. Uh, we call principal moment analysis. So this is work together with Rasmus Henningsson uh, and, and myself. And here you see uh, basically a so-called PMA plot to the right. We uh, The data is the, from gene expression omnibus. It's uh, mouse dendritic cells that were stimulated by different uh, stimuli. And then uh, uh, we, we have a series of, 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 of time points. And what I did here was basically uh, creating the, the time uh, trajectories. Uh, and I will, I will describe exactly what, uh, or, or at least <laughs> give an overview of what this uh, uh, method uh, does. But it's openly available uh, on this uh, web page. So if you go there, you can find the paper that we put on archive uh, last year, as well as a Julia implementation uh, and also uh, a PMA app that you can uh, start to, to apply to, uh, to data. So wh what is this? Um, so the general statistical setup here 
is is that uh, given a, a stochastic vector that takes values takes values in a, in a Hilbert space uh, on uh, on some uh, so defined on a sample space with a with a probability distribution we look at the push forward measure of this of this uh, probability measure and then we want to understand uh, mu so the pushed forward measure here uh, through sampling uh, and and pma is based so this is very informal uh, it's it's really just giving you the the flavor uh, you can look at the at the at the archive paper for for some mathematical details but uh, it's based on uh, simply a single value decomposition of what i call the sampling operator so this is the operator that you see uh, here you integrate over the hilbert space and you take uh, take the position x and you have uh, some density function u and you have your underlying uh, measure mu. And of course, you can look at this informal uh, definition of this, of this operator. You can look at it as a mapping from a continuous function with compact support on, on, on the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space itself, or you could look at it uh, under suitable conditions on the measure, etc., as uh, an operator from L2 uh, on the Hilbert space uh, with the measure mu to the Hilbert space itself. And this is, uh, I mean, so if, if mu happens to have a finite uh, mass and also a finite second moment, then this operator T mu is actually a compact operator. You can show that, and th this is uh, in, in our paper. And the, the dual in that case is, of course, the Ries mapping. Uh, so mapping uh, a point in X to, to its corresponding uh, continuous linear functional. Uh, directly from uh, estimating the norm, informally here, you see that uh, you can have different norms. So if you look at T mu as an operator from compact continuous functions to the, to the Hilbert space, you get the the, the maximum uh, 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 of the mean uh, expectation of 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 um, uh, uh, mean of the expectation of projection uh, measure, and uh, if you look at it, that's an L L two uh, h mu to h operator. Then you get this. Uh, projection squared and the mean value of that as as uh, as norms and uh, uh, if you look at those they are of course invariant under the orthogonal group there's an r missing here orthogonal group uh, and 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 as you all know i guess the singular value decomposition is quite stable so this is from a nice uh, paper by by uh, stewart uh, theory perturbation theory for singular value decomposition from 1990 and as he points out here uh, the basic perturbation bounds for singular values are that they are stable under uh, small perturbations of the underlying operator so e here is the perturbation and you have the these uh, nice theorems by uh, Vail and Mirsky telling us that uh, small errors in measurement etc does not impact uh, hugely the singular values that we we are looking at uh, so the PMA framework is actually a framework where you can uh, work both with the measure mu, uh, the uh, lower dimensional projections of mu, as well as approximations based on sampling of mu and projections of these uh, 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 approximate uh, measures. Uh, we have an implementation, as I said, with this app through our web page where, where we use uh, simplices. Uh, to approximate uh, the, the, the measure we are looking for. Uh, and uh, actually we used uh, the, to, to assess the, the intrinsic local dimension, we used uh, a dimension estimation technique from a paper a few years ago, uh, together with Kerstin Jonsson and again, Halot Soneson. 
which is a very quick and fast and and also very accurate uh, dimension estimator, also based on the skewness of of uh, uh, a simplex and it's actually uh, closely connected to this uh, norm of uh, uh, expected projection um, uh, the mean value of the of of of, of the expected projection uh, i would just highlight that some of the take home messages here on, on pma is that it's it's very fast even though we uh, approximate um, the underlying measure with, uh, for instance, a locally uniformly uh, un locally uniform Hausdorff measures on, on on simplices, and the simplices can have different dimensions in different parts of the sample space. It is fast. Uh, the, the number of degrees of freedom does not grow, so it's as fast as as principal component analysis. It's 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 more robust than PCA because it is uh, basically equivalent to to creating locally creating uh, an infinite number of pseudo samples and and smearing out the distribution over over these um, uh, simplices. It's it, it is statistically and conceptually sound. Uh, and uh, very importantly, it's possible to supervise using annotation information and expert knowledge. So this is where the integrative part comes in. So if you know, for instance, as, as I showed in, in the initial slide, that uh, points are connected uh, through time, so you can actually see those different stimulations uh, over time, you can build simplices that correspond to this time annotation and, and, uh, and basically create though an infinite number of pseudo samples indicating what you could look at as, as a visualization of, of, of pseudo time. Uh, there are some uh, other work we've done, something we call uh, uh, SMS, Singular Value Decomposition. We published a, a few years ago that I actually used to, to pick up the Apobec uh, signal in, in the data we looked at uh, before. Uh, this generalizes to this new setting. Uh, the projection score also generalizes to this new setting. And as uh, many of you have certainly realized, uh, a kernel version of, of PMA uh, is also uh, uh, immediately comes to mind. So you, you can use also nonlinear kernels here. Uh, I would just like to uh, finish uh, this talk by uh, addressing some general systems immunology uh, questions. So, so this is from a, a paper by Peter Brudin uh, from Karolinska in, 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 in Sweden, Stockholm. Uh, so he's a, a researcher working in systems immunology and, and really uh, have worked with different age groups. Uh, and his conclusions are basically those uh, four bullet points here. I mean, there is much, much more of obviously to what he has done, but the, the, those highlight a few things that he, he wanted to point out. So human immune systems are relatively stable uh, within individuals, uh, but incredibly variable between individuals. And this is also something we've seen in the milieu interior uh, work that we've been doing at Institut Pasteur and, and that I have been fortunate to be, to be a part of. Uh, induced responses to, to pathogen dif differ markedly among different age groups, and they are unique to different kinds of stimuli. Uh, functional gene expression responses uh, to common pathogens differ broadly across different age groups, and the immune cell composition uh, 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 also uh, changes over the course of life. So th these are things that we would like to understand in more detail. We hope to do this by longitudinal sampling, and we hope to do it by longitudinally sampling and uh, sequencing uh, single cells, so that we really get a picture of how cell different cell populations are growing uh, or decreasing over time and, and the crosstalk between different cell populations, whether that is in tumor or healthy tissue or in blood. 
So uh, some general uh, directions uh, where I invite you to to work with us and and uh, and and try to discover more is exactly these longitudinal sampling experiments where I see a huge potential for systems biology approaches really building uh, ODE or more complex. Uh, 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 models describing the time dynamics uh, that we, that we see, and integrate that with uh, statistical learning or machine learning uh, approaches uh, that that could highlight the features uh, that are robust and that could be predictive, and also provide us with new uh, targets to 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 help uh, patients. So. Um, uh, I, I think that, uh, so this is my last slide, and, and I would say that uh, when you look at, at uh, immunotherapy in, in, in cancer, you can basically say that um, very, uh, in, in a very general way uh, and, 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 and informal and, and not precise, but still you can say that around one third of patients in some indications, they, they do respond and they actually get cured using different types of immunotherapy. For instance, checkpoint inhibition in, in melanoma or in, uh, in lung uh, cancer. And, and these patients did not have any option uh, before uh, checkpoint inhibition. So it's part of these metastatic and highly aggressive cancers, the patients did not really have a, a treatment alternative before. Now they have, and around one third of them respond and actually get cured. And this, I think, is the first time you can really say that you cure cancer. Before we could do surgery, uh, so we could cut away the cancer, and that was sometimes highly successful and still is a very important part of, of cancer treatment. You could burn uh, the cancer by radiotherapy, also uh, a, a, a very useful and 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 uh, technique uh, and 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 treatment, and you could poison uh, the tumor with different types of chemotherapy. That uh, the basic idea there is that you hit cells that are rapidly uh, dividing, and the cancer cells are doing that, but then you get uh, uh, adverse events uh, that are connected with all. Uh, parts of the body or, or organs where you have a rapid uh, division of cells like like hair or or skin or intestinals uh, but now we have this immunotherapy where that actually helps our own immune system to 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 do uh, the the job it, it, it is uh, it is there to do namely eradicate it, take care of, of of the cancer cells and kill kill them so one third of the patient, they do respond and get cured. One third respond, but then uh, the cancer comes back. And for maybe one third, uh, it doesn't uh, help uh, at, at, at all. And we don't really, we start to try to understand uh, what discriminate those groups and start to try to understand what we can do for the groups that do not re respond. But uh, it's still a long way to go. And I'm very convinced that uh, whether you want to call it the cancer immunity state space or not, but really to understand the dynamics of patients under uh, treatment in this, in this complex uh, cancer immunity state space will be key to finding new ways to, to push uh, patients uh, back to to. A healthy position and here i am again convinced that we need to work together as a community so computational scientists working together uh, in close collaborations with biomedical bench uh, scientists uh, scientists and this this actually has to uh, at least from my perspective i think we we, we need um, a cultural change on, on in, in, in all groups here. So really uh, computational scientists that are willing to learn and, and really interact with uh, biomedical scientists like you by just being part of this network show that you, you, you are. 
uh, and 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 really then collaborate and 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 share uh, insights as well as data. And just of course, one last word before I finish is that. Uh, it is, of course, extremely important to realize that when you work with clinical data, uh, these are patient data, there are a lot of ethical and legal restrictions that we need to think very carefully about, and we need to work with patient organizations and, and of course, directly with patients themselves to, to make sure um, that both that we are using uh, the data in, in an ethical and legally uh, uh, correct way, but also that we actually try to, to, to make as much use of the data as possible to, to help uh, patients uh, going forward. I think that is a, a moral obligation for those of us who engage in this uh, type of research. This was my last slide, and I'm uh, super happy to, to take uh, questions. Thank you very much, Magnus. We send a round of applause to you for this uh, this great talk. Now we have we have time for questions uh, both here live in the Zoom channel and on Slido. In fact, there is one on Slido, and maybe I'll start with that. Um, again, the person asking the question says, "Thank you for the talk. Could you expand a bit more on the intuition behind PMA? How do we interpret the results?" Yes, so uh, the, the basic idea is uh, you can, I mean, you can already see it if you, if you say that you're working in, 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 a, in a high dimensional space and you are giving a few sample points. So uh, the under, uh, then you could say where, let, let's say I have two, two patients uh, in, in, in space, where would my next patient fall? Uh, so the best guess maybe we can do is that it will fall somewhere along the line between those patients that could be one guess that would create uh, this one dimensional simplex if i have uh, three points very close together in a high dimensional space where would my next patient fall M maybe in the triangle that those span so the convex uh, envelope of, of 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 these three points and this is basically what we do so uh, if we have a lot of, 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 of sample points in high dimensional space, we estimate based on this uh, simplex skewness. So, so the cool thing about the simplex, uh, simplex skewness is that you can with very few points actually estimate uh, a high dimension. You can use three points and just look at the expected uh, angles that you would have between those if, if we had a uniformly uh, distributed measure around them. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> then in high dimension, obviously, they would be uh, basically orthogonal. Uh, so this is the, the concentration of measure uh, uh, principle. But based on this, you can actually, from just three point estimate and say, oh, this looks like a 17 dimensional uh, place in, in, in space. So then we create those simplices. Uh, and and, and uh, we have uniform uh, Hausdorff measures of the correct dimension on the simplices, and we could, and, and we basically connect, make this complex of simplices. Then, uh, why I call it principle moment analysis is because it's exactly that. It preserves uh, the moment, the physical moment of of the of this object, and you project down to lower dimension, and you keep as much of the moment as possible when when uh, when you do so. PCA corresponds to basically just putting uh, Dirac distributions at every uh, every point sample point you have. So that is PCA. PMA is exactly PCA if you just uh, use uh, the the sum uh, normalized sum of of Dirac distribution corresponding to the points. Thank you for this uh, answer. And uh, Giovanni Visona, who is one of our ESRs, uh, is the first uh, question from him comes the first question from our Zoom channel here within the network. Hi, so first of all, thank you. It was a really fascinating talk. I have a couple questions. One of them may be something that I missed, but I wanted to make sure. Um, 
So one of the more, let's say, relevant things for PCA often in applications is that it is deterministic. Um, is it the same for a principal moment analysis? And if not, is it robust to, to iterations? Yeah, so uh, it is a deterministic uh, part, you know, the, 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 the key thing is, of course, how do you approximate an underlying distribution with, with, with some other distribution? Then you have to have a distance metric behind uh, be, be, between different distributions. You have to have an assumption of the underlying distribution in order to do this in an objective way. So there is an underlying uh, uh, assumption, but uh, if you want to do it concretely and, and have an analytic bound and, and, and basically show uh, robustness. Uh, without any knowledge whatsoever, I would say that PCA is, is clearly optimal. You have no assumptions whatsoever, but if you happen to, to think that you know something about your data, then you should build that knowledge into the construction of the approximate uh, measure. Th this, is the, this is the central thing. And I see it as highly useful when you do integrative analysis. So we, we might have annotations coming from you know, immunohistochemistry that tells us something about uh, these points. We can build that into the construction of this underlying measure. We might think that, oh, uh, uh, these should be, uh, you know, uh, there is a th th there is always an error when you do a measurements and uh, and 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 you can of course regularize this with uh, Gaussian kernels around each point, etc. So there there are multiple ways that you can work with this uh, framework. I. Um, I mean, it's simply a singular value decomposition of this sampling operator. It's very simple uh, and still very, very flexible. Uh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I can, I also have a more general second question. Yes, please. So I was a bit curious, um, how to say, about the follow-up steps after you perform something like identifying these um, um, immune signatures like the APOVEC signatures that you mentioned earlier, what is generally the procedure afterwards? So for example, do you try to decide whether it's useful for uh, diagnosis or treatment? Do you try to perform experiments first or try to determine the biology? Um, if you could just say a few words on that. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's also a very good question. It's, uh, so this is basically what we call reverse translational research. Uh, and I mean, translational research is that you look at cell lines, you, you do a lot of experiments with cell lines, and then you maybe move to an animal model, and then ultimately you, you go for successful targets. You, you, you do a, a phase one study and, and look for a dose escalation and, and toxicity, et cetera. Uh, what I described here is basically the other way around. You, you say that we are having all these clinical data on, on, uh, a, 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 on different uh, cohorts. And, and obviously, I mean, many people have said this, but, uh, but I mean, the best model for human health and disease is human health and disease. There is no better model. Uh, so we try to learn from, from uh, these uh, clinical trial data. When we, when we have a target like uh, the APOBEC here, of course, we then move it back to the wet lab and start to try to understand what uh, inhibiting or, or, or promoting uh, such a signal could, could look like. And there we, we, we do cell, cell line experiments, we do animal experiments, etc. And then, uh, so, so it's basically reverse translation, but then of course it's also going back again, if we are successful in the lab, we say that, oh, we have this antibody, for instance, that we can block this pathway. And then we, of course, try to, 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 to use it. So it's a long, even though we see a signal, it's a long journey to, to come up with uh, something that, that could potentially be a, a medication. And this is 
again where I think that computational scientists can help enormously because we can do a lot in silico. We don't have to do everything in vitro or in, in vivo in, in, in animals. We can do a lot computationally if we would have a you know, systems biology approach coupled to this more machine learning oriented approach. I, I firmly believe so. Thank you. And out of curiosity, what would be approximately a time scale for this long process that you mentioned, like five years, 10, 20? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's about uh, correct. Five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Are there further questions from the network? If not at the moment, there's one, then I, I would like to ask a question, Magnus. Um, when, I, when I'm listening to talks about dimensionality reduction like yours it was a great great talk i'm always impressed like how mathematical the, the the dimensionality reduction itself is but then there's usually a step to a very manual um, analysis namely the interpretation whether the the principal components or the principal moments in your case that you find are biological signal or technical variation or a form of confounder that that is then in at least in my opinion as an I would say informed outsider. Um, this is then a very manual effort or, or a human effort to, to think about uh, like the role of that principal component. Is it a biological signal or is it a co confounder? Yep. And, and um, of course one can say, well, that's then the research that you are doing as a computational biologist or as a statistician to think about whether this uh, reflects biological variation or technical variation. But wouldn't, I also ask myself, wouldn't that be like another prime um, task for machine learning here to support the user with hypotheses uh, whether this variation could now be biological, but it could be a confounder intra-patient variation or some, some complicated dependence on the machine that we are not aware of yet. I think the lack, to, to close my comment, the lack I often see is that what the, a human being can think of is often very linear, is often very simple as a confounder and the real confounders may be much more complicated than that. So do you see a role uh, for, for machine learning in that? Is my yes, yeah, that, that, is a that is a brilliant uh, comment or, uh, or question, Kasten. I, I completely agree. And I would say that that this is only lack of maturity. I mean, we the data that we need to 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 make those predictions has only just started to be generated. Uh, and I, I think we are at the at the beginning of of this AI and machine learning uh, revolution uh, within uh, you know biomedical bi research, but also clinical uh, care. Uh, because this is exactly what I think will happen. I mean, this gene set enrichment analysis that I performed, you know, manually, uh, of course, uh, should be done, uh, uh, I mean, in an automatic fashion and optimized uh, for, for biologically relevant uh, signal. And I, I'm, I'm, we are thinking about those things, uh, but I, I would basically say it's just a lack of maturity and we need we need you. <laughs> we need we need your network and 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 similar uh, similarly spirited uh, researchers uh, to work with us over time to create those uh, expert systems. Uh, still, I think there is always room uh, for interpretation uh, for uh, a doctor to interact with a patient and uh, and and discuss. Uh, treatment and here I think that things like visualization of, of data and, and trajectories etc will be a key. We need to have pictures or, or, or models, uh, conceptual models that we easily can understand to take decisions because the obviously the the end points of a lot of the research we do is is now uh, overall survival uh, objective response rate etc but for a patient it is also quality of life uh, so yes you prolong life with so much but how does how does that life look like how do you live your life it's it's all very well when we can actually cure uh, that 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 is fantastic, and 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 sometimes we can, and we hope we always should be able to to do it. 
but I think uh, often we can just prolong life and then quality of life is extremely important and here it is a dialogue uh, between the doctor and the patient and I think that this dialogue involves uh, conceptual models that are easy to to understand and and, and and grasp and and there it might be difficult to replace that interaction and conceptualization with uh, an expert AI system thank you thank you for a very detailed answer thanks uh, is are there are there further comments or questions for Magnus there is Lucas Lucas Miranda and other years are from the network, please. Hello, um, thanks a lot, Magnus, for, for such a wonderful talk and also very motivational um, towards working in the, in the field. I had a couple of questions noted down, many of which were already answered during your last slide, but there is one that remained um, out of utter ignorance and curiosity. I was wondering if you know how widely applicable uh, these immunotherapies are across the globe how accessible they are uh, to, to different peoples. Yeah, so this, uh, uh, this is a, a great uh, question and, and, and remark. Uh, obviously, I mean, the first approvals came 10 years ago. I mean, they, 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 we only had those options for a very uh, brief time. And we are, uh, 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 and I say we, I mean, a community of biomedical researchers and 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 uh, pharma companies across the world are developing uh, them at a at a high uh, uh, rate uh, attacking new indications and 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 uh, we learn that that a lot of these therapies are indication specific they work differently in different settings uh, and uh, we do expect them to be fairly, I mean, I share this uh, message uh, from the, the Cancer Research Institute uh, homepage that, I mean, the goal here is to cure all cancers. Uh, I think that goal is, is unfortunately um, quite far away in the, in, in the future, but, but we, I firmly believe that by different combinations of of therapies, both immunotherapies and more traditional therapies, we will be able to make uh, a huge impact for cancer patients over the over the next decade. I, I I'm very convinced. Uh, some of these therapies are 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 very expensive, and and obviously, I mean, this also has to be addressed. Uh, it's um, I would say that the 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 challenge of how the world looks like has been has been clearly uh, exemplified during the COVID uh, pandemic, and we need to learn from this. We need to be better uh, as as researchers, as a community, and 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 as a world. And this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, still, when I work in science, I, I I think that I mean scientists. We speak a universal language. We have friends all over the world, uh, and I think we can actually also help to build a, a, a better world. So, also this, I think, is is uh, for all of us extremely important to think about. Uh, what is the underlying motivation for doing things? And and for me, uh, being in science is is really uh, it's such a rich, richness to be able to engage with with people all across the world and have a common goal. I, I it, it gives meaning to my life. <laughs> yeah, sorry for being very philosophical here, but uh, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. If there are no further questions, then we thank Magnus again for opening our summer school. That was wonderful. And now we have a, a break until 10.30 and then we continue with the talk by Felix Agakov. I'm looking forward to that and uh, to seeing you again after a short break. Thank you Thank all. Thank you, Magnus. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.